Amen. That's why we came today, to lift him up. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jesus said, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And we praise the Lord. The church in the Bible is likened unto a candlestick because that's all we are. We are called to hold up the light of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. I am so glad and so thankful to be in the Lord's house on the Lord's day with the Lord's people. Amen. I want to thank all of you who have come out today to attend our district Sabbath. It's so good that we have these times where we can gather together from Kettle Falls, from Inchileum, from Northport, and just be reminded that we're playing for the same team. Amen that God is at work in our midst and we can encourage each other with our presence and our testimonies. I do want to remember those who could not be with us, who are ill today. We want to keep them in our hearts and our prayers. I've been uh, contacted by several who uh, really, really desired to be here, but they were unable to. So let's have them in our minds and in our hearts. Uh, But I want to uh, talk to you today on the subject Going all out. Thank you, Ralph, for reading to us Isaiah in chapter 58. And that's what I invite you to do with me this morning, is that you would join me and we can study Isaiah and the 58th chapter today. Uh, This morning we looked at that pivotal passage in Revelation chapter 14. Uh, I'm thankful for this quarter of Sabbath school lessons. Um, that was put together by Elder Mark Finley. Many of you know Mark Finley. He's uh, a prominent name among us, an evangelist that God has worked through powerfully. We give God the glory for his ministry. And I liked the comparison that Mark Finley made. He said, Revelation 14, 6 to 12, we call them the three angels' messages. That forms the Shema of Seventh-day Adventism. Amen? The Shema was that statement, that fundamental affirmation of faith of the Israelites found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 in the fourth verse. Shema, or listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They would repeat that daily. And so God has given us, we have the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, but in all of scripture, we see Revelation 14 verses 6 to 12, as our central affirmation of faith. And we talked about the everlasting gospel this morning. We must lead with the message that through Jesus, his living, his doing, his dying and raising again, we are saved from our sins. And that is the leading message in which we preach the warnings of the three angels that we must understand the times, that we may know what we ought to do. We must repent of our sins, our idolatry, our breaking of the commandments of God, and we must turn to Jesus with all our hearts, believe on him. And the fruit of that experience is that by the grace of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, we become obedient children, amen? And we obey God's commandments. So uh, that sets us up and leads us in to this study of Isaiah chapter 58, going all out. We're going to see that very much right along with Revelation 14, Isaiah chapter 58 contains God's special message for the remnant. As a matter of fact, as much as it is affirmed and we're told this chapter of Scripture is God's special message for the remnant, it's actually a shame how little we devote to actually studying it and breaking it down. And so we want to move in that direction this morning. I ask that you bow your heads with me, that we may claim the Holy Spirit's power and guidance as we open the word this morning. Father in heaven, thank you for your presence among us. Thank you for your all-powerful son, our mediator. Thank you for your ever-present, everywhere-present spirit. We thank you that we have his anointing to teach us. Father, they don't need me to teach them a single thing. I need to be taught of you. And it amazes me that you take jars of clay 
and you fill us with heavenly treasure. And that's my prayer this morning. Fill this jar of clay with the treasure of heaven. Fill the jars of clay that are sitting in the pews and joining us online. Fill us with the heavenly treasure of the word. Help us to see that these are the scriptures which testify of Jesus, every single one of them, every line in every book, every passage, every chapter, every verse. Teach us to humble ourselves before Christ, our living Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, I invite you to open your Bible, and uh, let's go right there to Isaiah in chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58, we're going to begin our study right there in the first verse. Isaiah and chapter 58. I love the sound of the rifling of Bible pages. We're told in Daniel chapter 12 in the fourth verse that many in the time of the end would run to and fro and knowledge would be increased. And sometimes we think that's referring to the advancements in technology and travel and trains and boats and airplanes and scientific knowledge, but really running to and fro means running back and forth in the book or the scroll. God was saying that in this time, the time of the end, God's people would be going back and forth in the scriptures and he would increase our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation. Isaiah 58, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Cry aloud, spare not. Some translations say, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet, they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Here we have God's prophet Isaiah being given the command to preach to the people. There is a loud cry that must be given. I wonder how many of us know that today there's a loud cry that has to go forth. Amen? Cry aloud. It's interesting. In the Hebrew, it literally means cry with the throat. Cry aloud, it's it's the idea of a passionate proclamation. Because uh, for my vocalists and uh, my friends who have studied voice, you understand that you're not supposed to speak with the throat. The throat is not the channel, but we must learn how to utilize the abdominal muscles and control the diaphragm and produce the proper sound and not to wear out our speaking organs. So when it says here, cry with the throat, it's not encouraging us to be unhealthy, but it's saying uh, it's a passionate cry. It calls forth from the inner man. There's a message that must go forth. And we have a clue here as to, okay, what's this message that has to go forth? We have some clues here because the prophet is told, lift up your voice like what? Like a trumpet. Now, the Israelites hearing this message would have had no doubt what was being referred to when uh, the prophet was told to lift up his voice like a trumpet. They understood the feast that they observed year after year, and they understood that yearly they observed a feast of trumpets. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 24 says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the what? The first day of the month, You shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of what? Of blowing trumpets. So they understood that they observed a memorial of blowing trumpets. And that happened on the first day of the seventh month. Because ten days later, something important came on the tenth day. And right here in the same chapter, Leviticus chapter 23, we see it says also the tenth day of this seventh month, shall be what? The day of atonement. So the message that's being given, that Isaiah is being called to preach, that loud cry is uh, directly speaking of a preparation for the day of atonement. This was the climax of the calendar of the Hebrew year. This was the day of judgment, 
Orthodox Jews around the world still observe it. You may have heard of Yom Kippur. Literally means the day of judgment. They understood the seriousness of this day. And that's why the prophet had to lift up his voice like a trumpet. Those 10 days, the trumpet was blown so that people could be alerted. It's time to seek God. It's time to turn from our wicked ways. Friends, one of the amazing characteristics of sinful humanity is how easily we deceive ourselves. It's amazing how quick we are to lie to ourselves. Let me ask somebody in here today, who likes to be lied to? We hate when people lie to us, manipulate us, try to trick us, try to mislead us. As a matter of fact, don't you hate it? Doesn't it try your pride when someone tries to lie to you because you think to yourself, do you think I'm stupid? My parents said that all the time. And now with three precious arrows in my quiver, I understand. When I see my children trying to get away with the antics, I'm like, you must think I don't know anything. And so it is offensive to us when others lie to us. But friends, how is it that we so quickly lie to ourselves? How is it so quickly that we tell ourselves we're all right when really we can be so wrong? It's amazing, friends, how easily it is for us as human beings to lack self-awareness. Not really understanding our life, our condition, not understanding our own thoughts and our own feelings, not taking consideration and understanding our actions or our negligence and how it affects others. And so the trumpet had to be blown. It was as if that trumpet was playing the melody saying, Stop playing games with God. A message had to go forth. And in a similar sense, that's what God is telling the prophet. He's saying, you know what? Cry aloud, and when you cry, spare not. You can't get mad at the preacher when he doesn't hold back. You can't get mad at the preacher when he gives the rebuke and makes no apology for it because it's the command from God. I, I have to let you know right here at the outset, close to the beginning of the message, friends, this is not a feel-good message. I, I'm not here right now to tell you, hey, you're doing good, we're doing good, we're on our way to heaven, amen, everybody's all right, let's just pat each other on the back and go home. I'm not here to tell you that, friends. The trumpet has to be blown. Because you know what? That day of atonement on Israel's calendar, it came year after year after year. Every seventh month on the tenth day, they observed the day of atonement. And God had his people repeat that system of festivals and sacrifices because he was teaching them the plan of salvation. And they needed to see it over. And they needed to see it over again, right? Uh, uh, tell them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Friends, we got to hear it over and over again. The repetition was to deepen the impression. But that day of atonement prophetically pointed forward to this time at the end of earth's history when God would be making up the number of his elect, when he would be sifting out his people. In other words, friends, we are living in the time where God is sifting and shaking his church. And right now, as you listen to my voice, you are either being sealed into the faith of Jesus Christ or you're being shaken out. And your life tells the true story. Your life tells the story. Are you growing closer to God? Do you love Jesus more and more? Is he more beautiful and precious to you? Do you long for more of a knowledge of his word? Do you spend more time with him? Is your prayer so sweet and enjoyable that it's hard to be broken from your seasons of communion with God to attend to the regular affairs of life? Or are you growing more lazy, more lax, more careless, more negligent? Are you finding more reasons to make excuses for why you don't do the things God has called you to do? Are we finding excuses to continue in sin, to give up the fight, to give up in discouragement and despair? Are we finding excuses for why we're weak and helpless instead of relying on the strength of Christ, of whom it says, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy? 
If you're honest with yourself, the story of your life is saying to you, my brother, you're being sealed in or you're being shaken out. That's the trumpet sound that has to go to the people. See, that trumpet sound is important. It's important that there had to be a loud cry because when you connect the testaments, when you start to see that big picture of the Bible, studying it from end to end and the, the matching passages from the beginning of the Bible to the end, you understand prophetically about that loud cry that had to go forth. We read about that loud cry in Revelation 18, verses 1 to 4. Listen, it says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. You see, the loud cry is not about the volume of the message per se, but it's using the volume as a metaphor for the intensity and the influence of the message. How much was illuminated with this angel or this messenger's glory? It says, the earth. Look at verse 2. It says, and he cried mightily. How? He cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And we read that. And we say, praise God, I'm not in Babylon. It tells us that Babylon has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. It tells us that much of the religious world today is really the stomping ground of the devil himself. And we say, yep, we see it. We see what they do in these professedly Christian churches. We see the kind of music they tolerate. We see the kind of soft, namby-pamby messages that are preached that make people feel comfortable in their sins. We see all the pagan practices and sinful worldly lifestyles that are tolerated and accepted and even celebrated. And we say to ourselves, praise God, I'm not in Babylon. We see people breaking the commandments of God, holding on to human tradition, and we say to ourselves, how can we break God's commandments and make excuses for it? How can we say that Jesus Christ died to do away with his law when it's really the fact that his law was unchangeable, that he had to die? Because the law cannot excuse even one sinner. Somebody had to pay the price. And we look down. How can people be so negligent, so deceived? In verse 3 it says, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. We look around, and we see more and more political corruption. We see more and more we're getting ever closer to the church uniting with the state to oppress those who will not agree with the majority. We see people being silenced and canceled. We see that truth is falling in the streets, that justice is turned around backward. We see that we live in an age where people call good evil and they call evil good. They put light for darkness, darkness for light, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And we say to ourselves, praise the Lord, I'm not in Babylon. Because verse 4 says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her who? My people, why? Lest you share in what? Her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. We say, praise God, I don't want to share in her sin. I'm not in Babylon, I don't want to have anything to do with her. There's a loud cry that must go forth. But friends, here's what we seem to have missed is that in order for God's people to be fitted up and equipped to give this loud cry to the world, there's a loud cry that must come to us first. Because when I read this text this morning in Isaiah 58, it says, tell my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. It's a message that does not allow us to sit back comfortably and rest and point the finger and say, she's guilty of her sins. It's a message that causes us to look at ourselves 
and say, why is it that in a world of darkness and in a world of deception, we have so little power to advance the truth? Why is it that the church of God is given over to reproach, to be mocked and ridiculed? Why is it that we find ourselves having so little ability to overcome the skepticism of unbelievers and to overcome the sneers, the jest, and the misrepresentations of other people who take the name Christian, yet they war against the truth? There's a loud cry that we must hear ourselves. We must be willing to acknowledge our own sins and our transgressions. And God begins to give us an idea of what it talks about. I want you to notice how a small word can have a profound meaning in a biblical text. They seek me daily, in verse 2, and delight to know my ways. That's a good thing, isn't it? Talk to me, friend. That's a good thing. I hope you seek God daily. I hope you delight to know his ways. I hope you do not forsake the ordinance of God. I hope you take delight in approaching God. But notice this little teeny tiny word that has a profound meaning in this text. It says that they do all these things as a nation. Now, this verse would be good. This verse would be a commendation if it said, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways because they are a nation that did righteousness. But it doesn't say that, does it? It says as. You can maybe even slip in the idea to make it more clear, as if they were a nation. Friends, we got to overcome this as if religion. We have to be willing to see that, wait a second, uh, 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 our worship, maybe we're sincere, it can be incomplete. It can even be unacceptable to God if we do not recognize our sins and our transgressions. Our worship, our coming together to participate in Bible studies and small groups and prayer meetings and church services can actually become offensive in God's sight if we're not hearing his voice and being diligent to turn from the sins that he exposes amongst us. As a matter of fact, our worship can become nauseating. And I know that because uh, that is what's being spoken of in the Laodicean message. When we are told that Christ, it says, I I'm about to spit or spew you out, literally means that he is ready to vomit. Right here in the book of Isaiah, uh, we have another passage that gives us an idea of what's going on here. Isaiah 29, verse 13 says, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people do what? They draw near with their, with their mouths. Okay, what's wrong? It says they honor me with their lips, but, key word in the text, have removed their what? Friend, are our hearts close to God? They've removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. And we say that, nope, that's not us. We're the remnant. We keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. We're not operating by the commandment of men. And praise God. We understand that we're not to yield to the tradition of honoring the first day as the Sabbath. We understand biblically, prophetically, Historically, that's a man-made invention and that God instituted the seventh-day Sabbath as a memorial of his creation, which points us forward to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, of whom it is said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Hallelujah. But friends, just because we may not be deceived on that point doesn't mean we haven't allowed ourselves to be influenced by the commandment of men. As we continue to read this morning, I want us to consider, well, well, wait a second, what ways, in what ways could we be influenced by the commandment of men? In what way could human reasoning and human philosophy have us worshiping God with our mouths, 
but removing our hearts far from him. And it's important to understand that the heart in Scripture is not talking about just the feelings and the emotions. It's not just talking about the affections. Because notice, they take delight in approaching God. That means they actually like coming to church. They like singing. They like hearing the special music. They like hearing the sermons. They delight in approaching to God. But the heart in the Bible, you might want to even write that down, the heart in the Bible is referring to the mindset. The mindset, the way of thinking. What it's saying is that these people say the right words, but they think the wrong way. They've adopted assumptions and limiting beliefs that hinder God from operating freely in their midst. Let's continue to read. Uh, let's go down to Isaiah chapter 58, verses 3 to 7. Just study with me this morning. Let's continue to read our text. We get an idea of the mindset, the wrong mindset that the people had. They say, why have we fasted and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls, that's more day of atonement language, and you take no notice? This is a, this is a proud people. And we talked about this this morning. You know what kind of people these are? These are the kind of people who think that their works and their efforts can earn them some sort of favor with God. Friends, we talk a lot about legalism. You have to understand legalism is a real problem. And I know we're in a setting where we say, oh, man, people always talk about legalism because they really just don't want to keep the law. They really just don't want to acknowledge that we have to obey God. They don't want to acknowledge that Christianity requires some real effort. It requires a change of life. It requires a self-denial. Even Jesus said, strive to enter at the narrow gate. Jesus understood that salvation requires our striving. And so we hear about this idea of works, salvation, or legalism, and we say, no, no, people are just using that as an excuse not to have to obey God. And that is true, and that is sad. But friends, we have to realize today that legalism is a real problem that always lurks around the corner. Can I help you understand this today? Legalism is the natural religion of the human heart. And we have a picture of it here. These people are doing these religious acts and expecting to be seen and noticed by God. They're expecting God to do something in response to their actions. How close is this sin to our lives, friends? This sin is so close to our lives, do you realize? Do you realize that every time, whether you do it out loud, whether you keep it to yourself, every time you grumble and complain, do you realize You're basically saying to God, God, I deserve better. You realize that, right? That's how easy it is for you to be legalistic. I know that if I were to give you a test and a quiz and exam today, and I was at, to ask you to write down, how is a person saved? And give me several texts. I'm pretty sure you could do pretty good on that test and that quiz. And if I were to ask you, true or false, a man is saved by his works, you wouldn't know how to give the right answer. But friends, legalism is not just a theoretical problem. It's a very practical and personal problem. When we allow ourselves to become resentful, we're saying, God, I deserve better. We're saying, God, why don't you see what I'm doing and who I am? Why, would you, why, why don't you make my life easier for me? God, why don't you notice what I'm doing and, and do something for me in a change? Right? Give me something back for all the stuff I'm giving. That's how close this is for us, friends. And that was the fundamental problem. And the truth is, that can extend even further into our life of worship. The concept that God has to recognize something about us, and he owes us something. Doesn't he know we're trying hard? Doesn't he know how hard I'm working to keep my life right and to try to be a good example to others? Doesn't he know I'm hard I'm working with these kids? Doesn't he know what I do at work every day and how many hours I put in? right? How does this happen? Man, are they really expecting me to do something else at church? Don't they know how much I'm doing already, right? Don't you see? Why have we fasted and you have not seen? You see what I mean? This thing is closer to our hearts than we realize. Let's keep reading, and, and maybe we can see that together. He said, indeed, you fast for strife and debate, and to strike with the fist of wickedness. 
You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. God wants to change us so that our acts of religion are not trying to get something out of God. We have to totally be divested. And I don't know anything that does this for us, but the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of Jesus Christ that can totally remove this idea that God is our heavenly slot machine, that we can pull on the handle and it has to, he has to just release to us some reward. And the quicker we can realize that we too often think of God that way and too often relate to him that way, the quicker he can actually bring us to true humility and grant us true strength. Friends, we talked this morning about salvation being through the worthiness and the value of Jesus Christ. We talked this morning about salvation not being through any value in what we give. Friends, there's only two motives that we can approach Christ with, fundamentally. You can either either approach Christ with the motive of earning, Jesus, give me something, give me something, give me something, Or you can approach Christ with the motive of loving. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We must keep the commandments. Obedience is the test and the evidence of a true salvation experience. But we also have to understand, we have to examine ourselves. There's a difference between an outward compliance to what we know is right and serving Jesus from a heart of love. A big, big difference. And that's the thing. These people are not worshiping Jesus from a heart of love. I'll admit to you this morning, friends, there's a lot in this passage that is kind of hard to understand. And it's hard exactly how to know how to apply it. But there's a lot in this passage that is easy to understand. And the meaning is too simple to be missed. For example, he said, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. And many of us in here, we don't have employees. We don't have people that work for us. But it's easy to understand that God cannot accept our religious acts of worship while we're mistreating people. Do you understand what he's saying? There's a difference between an outward compliance to what you know is right and a heart of love. Right? A heart of obedience will do everything that God says, but it will never use religion as a pretense for looking down on others and mistreating them. Look at verse 5. He asked them very pointedly, Is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out when you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? In other words, these people are fasting, but they don't understand what true fasting is about. They think fasting is about going without. Okay, I'm just going to stop eating. I'm going to deny ourselves. And one of the fundamental problems with our Christianity, friends, is that we judge our relationship with the Lord, by all the wrong things we don't do. And we pride ourselves on that. We're not the first ones, as a matter of fact, to have this kind of idea and approach toward religion. There's an episode in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. It says, also Jesus spake this parable to some who what? Who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And what was the, what was the fruit? It says they also what? They despised others. Okay, so now it's a little easier to really grasp and internalize Isaiah 58 because we see another account that shows us what it looks like. Verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Okay, in verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Look at what he says in his prayer. God... I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast. Did you see that? Is that the fast that Christ has chosen? I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Friends, we have to overcome this religious mindset of judging our goodness based on what we don't do. I don't drink, 
I don't smoke. I don't gamble. I don't go to the clubs and parties. You know, some are, I don't eat all those bad things of the world that have people sick and nearly dead. I don't fornicate or adulterate. I don't watch movies. I don't do this. Now, friends, as we saw earlier, the true gospel always comes with a call to repent of sin. Can you say amen? To turn from wickedness, to allow the Holy Spirit to overcome us and lead us away from sin. So if we are changed and transformed in Christ, praise the Lord, there are going to be some things we don't do. Can you say amen? And praise God when he gives us victory over evil because all these matters of disobedience, do they make our lives happier and healthier? No, they break us down and bring us into bondage. So praise God that by the power of the gospel and the grace of Jesus Christ, there are things we don't do. The problem is when we look at that and we say within ourselves, that is the epitome and the sum total of religion, that I don't do wrong. When there is a world all around us in need and we do nothing for them. See, friends, we would feel a lot less satisfied with ourselves. If you, start, if you start making that big list of don'ts, you can really kind of start to feel good and say, well, yeah, I, I'm doing pretty good. There's a lot of bad stuff I've gotten out of my life. But who? Raise your hand if you in here today can say, I've taken advantage of every single opportunity of good that has ever come my way. When the Holy Spirit speaks to me and convicts me to go talk to that person, to go help that person, I always go do it. See what, do you see what I'm saying, friends? Now, here's the thing. That is exactly how Jesus lived. The Bible says he went about doing good. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, if you'd like a reference. Jesus went about doing good. As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't even define the Sabbath by all the things that he could not do on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees had added burdens of burdens of restrictions. Don't do this on the Sabbath. Don't do that on the Sabbath. But Jesus taught that it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You see, friends, if we would look at the goodness of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus, how he obeyed his father, not just in staying free from sin, but he was always a source of joy and love and help to people in need, we would cast contempt upon all of our work. We would never see ourselves as being good if we really understood God's standard of goodness. We'd be a lot more like this guy in verse 13, and the tax collector, he stood afar off, didn't even feel worthy to draw near, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. You see that posture in prayer? That kneeling is not supposed to be like, oh, I know I'm at a conservative church today, I better kneel because everybody else is going to kneel. It's supposed to be because we feel our lowness before God and the weight of our sin and how dare I stand before God who is righteous and holy. But we really cry from our heart saying what? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know why he could have that experience? Because he wasn't like the tax collector. The tax collector, the problem with his prayers is that in his prayers, he was focused on who? Himself and other men. But this man was focused on God. When we compare ourselves with ourselves, when we compare ourselves to other people, we can feel pretty good about ourselves because there's always somebody who's a little bit worse. And if anybody seems to be stricter than me, I'll just call them ultra-conservative. And anybody who's a little more lax, I'll just call them liberal. When we put ourselves at the center, but friends, there's no way we can feel so good and satisfied with ourselves when we're looking at the righteousness of God. I'm telling you, friends, uh, uh, this is the problem. This is what Jesus is trying to get across to us in Revelation 3, verse 17. Because you say, I am rich and become wealthy and have need of nothing. 
I have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. See, friends, that's one of the problems, is that we cover ourselves with a robe of religion, but our heart, our mindset, our way of thinking is turned inwardly. A lot of times we look at Laodicea and we say, okay, they're lukewarm, so they're half-hearted, one foot in the world, one foot in the church. True, that's part of Laodicea. We say Laodicea is not self-aware. They don't know the truth about their condition. That is also true. Problem with Laodicea. But another problem with Laodicea is that in their religion, they're only ever focused on their needs. And so they look at themselves and say, I'm, I'm all right. I don't need anything. I'm doing pretty good. And it causes, it, it, it causes this condition where God has to send the loud cry saying, no, tell my people about their sins. Tell them that they, they've really missed the point. They're coming to me, expecting to manipulate and control me because they think they're good. They think that I'm obligated to recognize their goodness and do something for them. You see, friends, it, it, it's the, this, is, this is the thing. Notice what he says. Notice that all of these terminologies are active, right? He's saying that this is the fast that I have chosen. What is the, what is the fast God has chosen? It's about loosing bonds of wickedness. It's about undoing heavy burdens, about letting the oppressed go free and breaking every yoke. Now, understand this. Each one of these things, I'm not going to go into detail on exactly what they mean. Because if you understand any of these words, they have a literal and a symbolic significance. Or in other words, they have, these are literal needs of people and these are spiritual needs of people. Do you understand what I mean? Like, for example, help me out. I know, I'm, I know I'm in a room with some Bible scholars. He says, is it not to share your bread with the hungry? Are there literal hungry people in the world who need bread? Okay. Are we in the United States where people eat a lot of food every day, but they're still malnourished for lack of actual health education? So they can be full and still be hungry, right? Isn't that one of, isn't that one of the phenomena of the United States? that we can actually have so much food and still be so unhealthy, okay? But what did Jesus say about himself? He said, I am the bread of life. Are there lost sinners who are hungering for the bread of life? I really want you to think about your relationship with God. Just, just be honest with yourself. How much have you studied your Bible versus how much have you shared what you know with others? And just be honest. Is it... Is it, is it equitable? Is it, is it proportionate? How much you've taken time to learn, to watch videos, listen to sermons, hear speakers, Sabbath after Sabbath, camp meeting after camp meeting, versus how much have you been personally involved in sharing your bread with the hungry? See, friends, God is saying, change your standard. Stop, stop thinking that fasting is all about going without. Uh, let me just appeal to your logic this morning. Let me appeal to your logic by asking this question. Bible scholars, when did the anti-typical day of atonement start? Somebody said it. Say it louder. Who said it? What year? Give me the year, friends. 1844. Okay, we got some studying to do. That's okay. We're not studying the prophecies right now. But 1844. When we talk about fasting in the day of atonement, is there anybody who could go without eating from that time till now? No. So obviously, the fast that God has chosen is not about going without. You know, it's interesting. He says, look, you're fasting for strife and debate. Now, I don't understand exactly what that means, but here's the thought that came to my mind. What does it mean to fast for strife and debate? Does it mean like, Lord, I don't want to, and I've actually known people like this, Lord, I'm not going to eat because I, I got to talk to somebody later. I want to, my mind to be really clear. Does it mean that? Uh, th does it mean you're fasting and praying, saying, Lord, uh, I want to prove this other person wrong, so maybe if I fast more than them, I'll... I don't, I don't know what it means. But it made me think about this. How much of our religion is based on strife and debate? Like, for example, in, in the book Evangelism, page 172.2, it says we need far less controversy and far more presentation of Christ. 
How often are our thoughts about winning others to the truth about proving people wrong? Right? What about uh, page 172.3? The many argumentative sermons preached seldom soften and subdue the soul. Right? I wonder if that's what Jesus means. You're fasting for strife and debate. Your, your religion is all about proving the next guy wrong and feeling good that you're right, that, that you see the truth, that you had enough sense to recognize, yeah, the Sabbath is the seventh day and not the first day. Yeah, man, I got this. Friends, we have to understand that we shouldn't be using our teachings to prove people wrong, but we should be using our teachings to make their lives better. I love this statement, education page 296. Something better is the watchword of all education, the law of all true living. I also thought about how it said that we have to break every yoke. And we know that Jesus tells us uh, that we are to come to him and to find rest. And Jesus says what? Take my yoke upon you to learn from him. So if Jesus says, take his yoke upon us and learn from him, that means what? That means wearing any other yoke other than Christ means that we're serving another master. If we're wearing another yoke, it means we're not doing his work in his way, or it means we're not doing his work at all. It means that you're not partnered with Christ in his work. And so the Bible is saying we have to break the other yokes. The, the thing is, it's saying that there are other influences that control our life. There's other goals and other aspirations that we're working for that take priority over serving Jesus Christ. And Jesus is saying, I cannot accept that. I cannot accept that kind of fast. Friends, are, are you wearing the yoke of education, the yoke of your career? Are you bound to the yoke of money? I have to make enough money. I have to take advantage of all these years I have of earning so I can build up a nice, secure enough retirement. What, that mentality is not wrong in and of itself, but if we're, if, if we're more if we're more concerned with making money and securing our future than we are with working with Christ and helping people find security in Christ, we're wearing another yoke. Are you yoked up with fear? Just afraid. What are people going to think of me? What obstacles and hardships am I going to have to endure if I really, if I really go to work with Christ? Yoked up to laziness. Friends, we can be yoked up to ongoing sin, that, that, that we're constantly repeating the same sins not taking the victory Christ has so we can't truly work for him. I, I want you to hear these words. They're directed to the youth, but they have application to all of us. I want you to understand what is life's noblest aim and highest ambition. In that same book, Education, page 296, it says, often the youth cherish objects, but put, just put yourself there. Often people cherish objects, pursuits, and pleasures that may not appear to be evil, but that falls short of the highest good. Friends, I want to suggest to you today that breaking every yoke means we have to stop falling short of the highest good. We have to stop settling for okay. It's okay to come to church, but the highest good is that we should live to bring other people to Christ. Right? We, we, you know, it's not just about who comes to church, it's about who goes for Christ says, let them be directed to something better than display, ambition, or self-indulgence. Bring them in contact with truer beauty, with loftier principles, and with nobler, nobler lives. Lead them to behold the one altogether lovely. When once the gaze is fixed upon him, the life finds its center. You see this? The enthusiasm, the generous devotion, the passionate ardor of the youth find their true object. Duty becomes a delight and sacrifice a pleasure. And here it is, to honor Christ, to become like him, to work for him is the life's highest ambition and its greatest joy. I want to ask you today, are you living for life's highest ambition? If we're not, that's the problem Jesus has in Isaiah 58. I know maybe you've read this and said, oh, there's a lot of stuff in there I don't understand. What is it really talking about? Friends, the message goes on, and Isaiah says, uh, then your light shall break forth like the morning. In other words, it's when we accept God's chosen fast. It's not just about going without. We shall have light 
Your healing shall spring forth speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Friends, I can't take time to read to you everything I have for you today, but I want to make this clear to you. A lot of times we look at the work that God is calling his people to do in the last days, and we say it's too much. I'm too tired. I'm too busy. I'm too sick. I have too many other things on my plate. And we look at the work. I'm talking about the work of personal soul saving, of actually bringing your friends, your neighbors to Christ. Not just the public ministries we do. Praise God for them. They have their place. Not, not just the ministries that we do to reach other Adventists. Praise God for ministries that reach other Adventists and disciple and grow them and build them up in the faith. That's important. But go read Jesus' words about loving, becoming like your Father in heaven. One of the things Jesus says, he says, if you greet your own brothers only, how are you not like the Gentiles? If our ministries, our camp meetings, our publications, our events are only ever to entertain, to educate, to build up other Adventists, are we really doing the work? We're not, friends. We often say, I can't do it, it's too much. And Jesus is saying, no, if you would do this work, then you would have light. As a matter of fact, he says in verse 11 that I would guide you continually. I would satisfy your soul in drought. I would strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. This is exactly what Jesus was referring to when he said, the one who believes on me as saith the scriptures, out of him shall flow rivers of living water. This he said of the Holy Spirit, right? It's saying that, uh, let me put it like this, friends. A lot of times you hear people say, oh, I'm just too busy to pray. You ever heard anybody say that? You ever thought of that yourself? I'm just too busy to pray. And you say back to them, no, my dear friend, you're too busy not to pray. In the same way, okay, we say to God, God, I'm too tired, I'm too committed, I'm too busy to work for you. And he's saying, no, you're too tired not to be working for me because this is the actual work that will strengthen your bones. This is the work that will bring healing and health and joy and prosperity into your life when you're actually taking your eyes off of self and saying, God, what have you called me to do for others? I need to wrap this up, so let's do it like this. I want you to get an idea of what God means when he says we're supposed to be fearing him. We know we're supposed to fear God and be keeping his commandments to be worshiping him. Well, think about this. In Job chapter 1, verse 1, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and he was what? One who feared God and shunned evil. And we think about the righteousness of Job. But how often do we read these verses later when he shares the testimony in chapter 29? He says, when the ear heard, then it blessed me, and when the eye saw, then it approved me, because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper. The blessing of a perishing man came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind, and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor, and here's the thing that we don't think about. What does Job say he did? He says, I searched out the case that I did not know. In other words, Job actually looked for opportunities. And that's exactly what God is saying that we have to do. When God says, if you extend your soul to the hungry, all the studying I can do, what that means is if you will actually go out to them. Stop sitting around waiting for an opportunity to come to you to work for God, but go out and create an opportunity. That's what Job did. He searched out the case he didn't know. He went and made opportunities to glorify God. He went and found people that needed help. He went out to get to know them, to understand their problems, to understand where they were lacking, and he used all that abundance that God had blessed him with to help and to serve others. And as a matter of fact, even in Job's distress, that was one of the things that distressed him, is he was saying, Lord, when I was prosperous, I could do more for others, but now I can't do that right now. Do you understand what I'm saying today, friends? We are, too, we are too weak not to give ourselves to work for God. Because we need energy, because we need health, we need to place ourselves in the channel of God's grace and blessing by actually going forth 
to work for him. See, friends, I, I want you to see that that's what's said here. When Jesus tells this story of the ten lepers that came to meet him and they said, Jesus, have mercy on us. And Jesus saw them and said to them, go show yourselves to the priest. One of my favorite little phrases in the Bible, it simply says what? As they went, they were cleansed. So often we say, I'm struggling so much myself. I have such a hard time with my family. I have such a hard time with my relationship with God. I have sins I'm still struggling with that I, I wish I had a more permanent, lasting victory over. And we need to just adopt this principle. As they what? As they went, they were cleansed. Sometimes we can sit around the church and say, but we got to reform. We got to get right. We got to get on the same page. And the truth is, a lot of the problems that we have would work themselves out if we would make serving Christ our focus. It would actually give us an impetus and motivation to make sure that we're reviving and reforming and living righteously before God. As you go, you will be healed of your own problems and your own issues. God will give you solutions. Don't you remember when that lawyer came to test Christ and he asked, what is the greatest commandment? And, and, and the Lord said, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. And the guy wanting to justify himself said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And you know the story Jesus tells about the man who got robbed and was left on the side of the road. And a priest passed him and didn't help him. A Levite passed him. They didn't help him. Uh, and and imp by implication, this was a Jewish man that was left for dead. And two of his Jewish brothers did not help him. But then a certain Samaritan came where he was and had compassion and bandaged his wounds and poured on oil and wine and set him on his own animal. And he brought him to an end and took care of him. And he even gave the innkeeper money to watch over this guy and say, I'm going to come back for him and whatever he needs, I'll pay for it. And so what Jesus gets from that is he says, which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? Do you understand what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, when you keep his commandments, you don't sit around asking, who's my neighbor? You don't sit around asking, well, what can I do? That's what who's my neighbor means. What can I do? I need more training. I don't know how to do this. Where can I serve? That's who's my neighbor. Jesus is saying, when we truly obey his commandments, we actually look around and say, who needs me to be a neighbor to them today? Who can, the question on your heart and mine needs to be, who can I be a neighbor to? And I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit will impress our hearts and minds that this is what's missing from our religion. And even with our steadfastness and our loyalty and our commitment to historic Adventism, God is saying, I love you guys, but I can't really, I can't accept it. It's actually nauseating. If we're going to come here and keep the Sabbath and be strict in our faith, but we're not going to have hearts of love and loyalty. This should make us rethink the meaning of text when it says that the saints in the last days keep the commandments of God. That means the saints in the last days, they do keep the Sabbath. But if we keep the commandments of God, that means we go out looking for needs to meet. That means we go out finding ways to be neighbors to the people in our world. Friends, the conclusion of the matter is this. That last refrain in Isaiah 58, he tells us to honor the Sabbath, and that when we honor the Sabbath, then shall you delight yourself in the Lord. Friends, a lot of times we have quoted this. I've heard churches use this as their affirmation. They repeat it every time they worship, and that's good. Well, this is one of our defense texts for the Sabbath and how to keep it. You keep the Sabbath by finding delight in God and not doing your own ways and speaking your own words, and all that's true. But what this chapter of Isaiah 58 is all about, with all the words and phrases and concepts that you might struggle with and say, what exactly does that mean? How exactly does that apply? The message of Isaiah chapter 58 is simply this. We're not truly keeping the Sabbath until we're keeping the fast that God has chosen, until we're extending ourselves going out to meet needs. I'm talking about personally and individually where you say, because I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, because he's introduced me to the truth of his word, because he's brought me to life through the Holy Spirit, I praise God for the pastor, I praise God for the church, I praise God for all the ministries, but really I don't need any of that to go out and be his light and his vehicle to bless and help another person. 
Now, praise God when we can have good programming and planning to kind of bring some unity and structure. But the truth is, it, I, it's, it's better to have a church with so many loose atoms of people just going out and working and serving and you just kind of got to make it all work together than having a church that's well-structured and organized. But where's just that real personal burning desire to go out and help others? That's the message that we have to get today. This is the message of Isaiah 58, the special message for the remnant, that true Sabbath keeping is about living a life of sanctification and service. Think about what Paul said. This is some of the most powerful words in Scripture. Paul says, to me, to live is Christ. What does that mean? That means Jesus is the meaning of life. What is my purpose? What is the will of God for my life? Christ. To live is Christ. I want to ask you, how can we keep the Sabbath? How can we truly rest knowing that so many of our family, friends, and neighbors have not found rest in Jesus Christ? How can we really keep the Sabbath? How can we rest knowing that so many have not been established in the present truth? So many professing Christians are believing false doctrines that sooner or later will turn their hearts from God. The true rest is when, through the power and grace of Christ, we're allowing God to fulfill this word. Friends, let's summarize the message. I'd like to give you a sentence or so to summarize the message. Here's your sentence today that God wants us to understand. What are we supposed to be doing? What is the fast that God has chosen? Friends, Fasting in the anti-typical Day of Atonement is not about going without. It's about going all out. And Jesus is saying, you want to truly keep the Sabbath? You want to truly be ready to give the loud cry and lift up your voice like a trumpet and call people out of Babylon? Do you want that, friends? Amen. Amen. He's saying, we have to let the Holy Spirit have full control. And having the Holy Spirit have full control just doesn't mean, Lord, Help me not to eat this cheese. I know it's not good for me. Praise God. That's a part of it. Take your health very seriously. And I have a lot of growing, and we all have a lot of growing to do in many areas. But friends, letting the Holy Spirit has, have full control means, Lord, I'm on mission for you. Everything is secondary. Show me where to go, who to meet. Show me how to work. Show me how to come into unity with my brothers and sisters in the church so that the work we could be doing individually scattered all around could be multiplied tenfold if we learn how to channel those efforts and go one direction. Friends, do we want to keep the Sabbath? Amen. I invite you to stand with me right now. Amen. Just want to say a prayer with you all. I want to invite you in your own heart. Just ask God. Lord, have I sold you short through a limiting belief of exactly what and how much you really want to do through me in these last days? Ask that to God. I dare you. Pray that with a sincere heart. Ask him, Lord, have I made excuses? Ask him, am I deceiving myself by observing an outward religion? and committing myself to the Seventh-day Adventist faith and going to church, etc. But I'm really not letting the Holy Spirit use me as his vehicle for service, for sharing the gospel, for leading others to Jesus. I dare you, just ask him. I can plead with you so far. I can explain a scripture and connect a verse here and there. But let the Holy Spirit talk to you. I want to take this time right now to invite you. We're going to have a potluck after this. We are going to have an afternoon service at 3. Where we're going to speak practically, okay? Okay, Pastor, that's, that's a good message. You know, the Sabbath is about sanctif being sanctified and being a servant. And, but how? We're going to talk about how. how. How can this happen in the life of our local churches? How can God accomplish this in our district? We're going to talk about it at 3 p.m. So I invite you to be a part of that. But right now, before we get another shred of information, and information is important, before you get another shred of information, will you give Christ your heart? Will you have that spirit of the reformers? Praise God, we're the heirs of the Reformation. Will you have the spirit of the reformers of, Lord, 
I will follow all the light I have and all the light you shall show me. Where you go, I will follow. Will you just give your heart to Christ right now saying, Lord, I, I don't even really understand fully of all you can and desire to do through my life and witness in this, in this world in the last days. But Lord, whatever it is, whatever dream, whatever vision, whatever goals and pursuits you have for my life, I open my heart to them now. My question is, are you willing to have faith in Christ? Are you willing to say, Lord, I'm willing to trust the path you've shown me, even if you haven't shown me the destination? Are you willing to say, Lord, I'm trusting you to take me to the destination, even if you haven't shown me the path? Will you give your heart to Christ in that way? Here's the time now. I'm not even going to call you up to the front right now, but right there where you are, I invite you in your heart to just talk to God and say, God, show me, save me, save me from that condition of judging myself by what I don't do and thinking I'm better than others. Save me from not realizing my true condition and thinking that I have it all together or thinking I have all I need. Save me from thinking I know the truth. My theology is correct. I don't need anything else. Just say, Lord, save me from being content and satisfied with myself and my work. Help me to be, to be caught up in the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, to lose myself in him, to the point where my zeal for spreading the gospel will know no limits. I believe Christ can and will do that through us. Brother Buck, I invite you up to lead us in our closing song. Number 365 in your hymnal.